Lenny Gallant. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Fiona? All the way from beautiful PEI. We're bookending the country tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's sort of almost nighttime there, and it's definitely daytime in, in Vancouver. Um, welcome to Backstage at CapU. So this is our virtual program that we've been doing, oh my God, for the past year. And we all know why we are virtual. We were on we were on screens, Lenny, as opposed to being on a stage together, which is way more fun. But it's great to see you all the same. Uh, and uh, I think this this series of, of shows wouldn't be complete without uh, getting your story, our story, how we connected uh, well over twenty years ago now. Yeah, it's been a while. And uh, I think you were one of our very first artists that we presented on our stage in our Folk and Root series then. It's now evolved to be called the Global Root series because I do like to encompass artists from all over the globe. Um, and I just, I just wanted to share the story of how I discovered you, uh, Lenny. You, you came to Vancouver for a concert in the early 90s. It was a double bill with Rollins Cross out of Nova Scotia. Do you remember the tour? I do remember the tour. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, and so it was at the Vogue Theater, and uh, I, I remember I, I had heard of you and Rollins Cross, but not super familiar with your music. I'd been living in Vancouver since around 1984, so I've lived out here a long time. You know I have East Coast roots. Yes, I do. Uh, grew up in Newfoundland. Um, anyways, I. I Totally loved your show and got in the CD lineup at the end of the show. Uh, I wanted to get your signature and I wanted to say hello to you and just tell you how much I enjoyed your music and you've got a new fan. Uh, so we said hello way back then. I don't expect you to remember. It was a big line of people, Lenny. <laughs> so you made a lot of fans that night. Um, but I never forgot about you and when I was in this position, new position at Capilano University, the the theater had just been built, so a brand new theater. Uh, I thought of you, and um, it was it was a whole different world back then. Like it was almost pre-internet. Yeah. So I dug out your your CD, and it had a snail mail address uh, to your to your record label in in Rustico PEI. Oh, in the big time. <laughs> I actually like wrote a letter to you <laughs> and mailed it. And maybe two weeks later, I get a phone call in my office, and it's you calling me back. So I, I left my phone number to contact me at, and uh, I was like, I, I don't know, I was a bit starstruck and uh, delighted that that you called and then um, that you were open to coming out uh, to be a part of our series, um, brand new series. Um, so I'm glad that you trusted me. What do you remember this at all? <laughs> I do. I remember the. I remember the the venue, and and I was really excited, you know, because I hadn't had a whole lot of opportunity to play out west. You know, I've been out there a number of times, but but not nearly as often as I had hoped. And and so, and to, to be able to play your theater at the, on the university campus, that was that was awesome. That was great. Right, and you remember you did a few other dates around BC as well. And uh, I remember ours was the first show, and you really you connect it well with. Peter, our, our audio tech. Yeah. So you took him with 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 you on the tour, I think. That's right. Yeah, we stole your tech. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he did a great job. The work, great working with Peter. So Lenny, I guess uh, so. That was that was our introduction, and uh, we've been connecting on and off over the years, and we've had you out as as much as possible. It's not always easy to to get across the whole country, and. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the last time we were supposed to play there, we we, uh, we had a so-called snowstorm, uh, <laughs> and uh, we weren't able to weren't able to make the show, unfortunately. From by East Coast standards, that was that was not a that was a light snowfall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know uh, you <laughs> East Coasters like to to make fun. I mean, I feel like I'm a West Coaster now. I am a real wimp when it comes to bad weather. Uh, it was strange. It was late February in 2018, um, and they were predicting snow and we, we waited till about three o'clock that day to, to cancel the show. I can't believe that. And I knew it was going to be weird for you being from PEI, from spending so much time where there's so much snow. 
that we would actually cancel. But yeah, I, I actually managed to drive over no snow tires to, to, to see you at least and have a little hang uh, at, at the Lonsdale Key Hotel with you. <laughs> so, um, it got bad enough later that we, 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 uh, we gave it okay. We said, ah, oh, well, you know, I could understand why they canceled. <laughs> well, tell us about um, your trip to Penticton because I know you had to drive to Penticton maybe the next day. Oh yeah, that was a that was a crazy drive. Uh, I was I was traveling with my uh, nephew Jeremy, and uh, it should have been like a four hour drive, uh, but the, it it was a really bad snow storm up in the up in the mountains, and uh, there was I remember a couple of times when we were driving down this mountain, and Jeremy, my nephew, who plays uh, piano with me, he was asleep next to me, and I was glad he was asleep because. It, it was like the whole side of the mountain was just, just nothing but ice and I was going down this side of this mountain and I was so afraid that uh, I was going to lose control of, of the vehicle because it was it was uh, very frightening and when I got to the very bottom of there was no other traffic on the road thank God because I didn't have to worry about running into somebody on the way down but when I got to the bottom of the, of the mountain there were all of these trucks lined up for long or a kilometer or more just who couldn't make it up the mountain and we were waiting for assistance and there were cars in the ditch everywhere there were ambulances and cop cars and i was thinking this is crazy <laughs> and then we got to uh, we got to uh penticton we were doing the show and it struck me so funny because i had there's a new song on my uh, time travel album called there's a storm coming and and jeremy and i were playing this song and i got to the line uh, in the song that said uh, i drove 11 hours to be here tonight the fire is bright I drove a little hours to be here tonight. There's a line in the song and I realized, oh my God, that's exactly how long it took us to drive to get to that venue. Oh my God, it was at prophetic. Jeremy. It was a I prophetic at, song. I looked at Jeremy and he looked at me and we both started laughing. I could hardly continue the song. It was, it was funny. I remember seeing you when you came out for the 2010 Olympics. Yeah, that was fun. Do you remember you played? You played a few a few places. We did a lot of shows uh, out there while we were out there, but we got to play a medal ceremony. Uh, that was that was very cool. One of the medal ceremonies and uh, on the big stage, and and then we did a lot of uh, concerts. And uh, there were so many venues around, and because I perform in both French and English, if if, if necessary, mostly English, but. When the occasion call, I'll do French shows as well. So we had some, we had quite a bit of work. I think I remember you playing at a, at a big show downtown with Dead Mouse. Do you remember? Yeah, yes. <laughs> no, that was crazy. He, you know, uh, did you get audience, to meet him? Was, no, I didn't get to meet him. I didn't hang around for the whole evening after we had to be somewhere else after our performance. But I remember thinking. This is such a bizarre lineup. I mean, our music is not exactly uh, in his in his realm at all. Uh, Deb, Deb Mao and uh, and uh, um, and he sold the place out really quickly. So it was all, all basically all his fans that were at the venue. It was a huge stage because he's extremely extremely well known. People bought the tickets early, and and all when my fans went to get tickets. They couldn't because it was sold I out. I couldn't even. I couldn't even talk my way in, Lenny. I came down, like you said, drop down, and uh, and I don't know. It, security was crazy. Yeah. I tried to talk to someone. They just kept passing me off to another person, and eventually I gave up. <laughs> well, and I was kind of concerned because I'm thinking, well, what are they going to think? They don't have a clue who I am. But we went out and we did our show. It was a massive audience. We did our show, and people loved it. They. We got a tremendous response. Oh, that's great. I was kind of counting my lucky stars that <laughs> people like what we did. That was a fantastic two week period in, in Vancouver, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot, had a lot of fun. It was, it was, really, it was really great. Ash, Ashley McIsaac um, did a concert, a free, a free concert, at a small venue. And I think the show started at 8 o'clock, and people were literally lining up first thing in the morning, like nine o'clock in the morning, and I felt really blessed because it was a great place to see Ashley play. Have you, have you ever had the pleasure to uh, work with Ashley or perform with him? Oh yeah, we're friends. We played together a couple of times. Uh, so it's always great to see him. Uh, he, he's a bud, so he's, he's a fabulous musician, you know. He's great, a, great. incredible. He's kind of a crazy guy. <laughs>
oh yeah he's he was, he's uh, very funny he's very funny and he's he's off the cuff and he's an artist through and through you know he's a he always surprises me i remember driving down the road and hearing a song of his i was like who is that that's a great song who's oh it's ashley wow i had no idea <laughs> and then uh uh and and then you'd see him play piano. He's a wicked piano player too. You know, it's it's a, he's a he's a really quite an artist. Yeah, he's a, he's a treasure, Canadian treasure like you, Lenny. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Adam. Yeah, it's always no, so true. Um, I also want to talk about your history with our French festival here, Festival de Bois. I know you've got a virtual performance this month, and I think you can just go in and watch it at your leisure. Uh, on the site yeah i'm not sure how long it's up but uh as you probably know i played that festival before yes indeed yeah it's a really fun <laughs> festival out in mallardville and in, in coquitlam i know i was really surprised to find out that there was a french festival outside of vancouver and uh, it was a number of years ago and, and they got me out there to play and i at that time i had released a french album uh, and so it was great we had a wonderful time uh, now, since that time, my partner Patricia and I have, have started a, uh, a francophone duo called Sirene et Matalot. Mm. It means the siren and the sailor. And so we, we, we kind of put all the French stuff into Sirene et Matalot now. And we have a brand new album out. <laughs> And uh, I'm really proud of this record. It's one of my favorite records I've ever made. And uh, it's been doing really well on, on, on the francophone, Acadian radio. And we've been doing, uh, you know, doing some, some playing. We were supposed to have a tour uh, earlier this year, which got canceled, unfortunately. So hopefully we'll be doing it in the, in the fall. But uh, we've been playing quite a few, quite a few venues uh, doing that, doing the Serendi Matado thing. Great. Well, that's a really nice segue. I, I did want to talk about your your very rich history. You've got such deep roots in in PEI, one of the original families, uh, uh, Acadian history. As you say, my roots go very deep on, on Prince Edward Island. And over the years, even though I, I write about all kinds of things, over the year, each album might have a, a song that touched on PEI in some way or form and various other projects. And so I decided to gather all of these songs and write a few more and tell and my stories pertaining to where i grew up and i put together a show called searching for abigoit in combination with my sister karen's artwork i um, used a couple of hundred of her paintings projected on this gigantic uh, screen and behind us and, and basically it talked about pei past present and future and and, and, and also just my personal history there and, and uh, the gallant name is actually uh, uh, one of the oldest names on Prince Edward Island because uh, the first two families who settled there were were the the Galants and 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 uh, I think it was Martin. So the first the Gallant the name Gallant was born on Prince Edward Island uh, in 1720. And the name Abeguet is am I am I butchering it? Uh, well, the original name uh, Mi'kmaq Mi'kmaq name is Epiqui. For P E I, yeah. Epiqui, but over the years it got it got a little bit more anglicized to Abigway. My show was called Searching for Abigway using the more recognizable name. Well, it's a real natural for you to, to work in multimedia. You're, you're very theatrical, Lenny. You're very good at storytelling. It's, I think it's an East Coast tradition though, isn't it? Well, I, yeah, it's like you gotta be. You have to be a storyteller and part-time comedian to be able to do a show around here, it seems. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know. um, so uh, it's do or die kind of thing. Did you grow up in a musical family? My mom played piano by ear, uh, and she was always the life of the party. You know, at any party, she was always called upon. And uh, my dad's a good singer, but he doesn't really play anything. They were both part of the choir. We, I come from a small Acadian community, and uh, 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 and beautiful choir in the church. This wonderful, all amateur, but very very cool. And uh, didn't really have a lot of mentors in my particular circle growing up so i was kind of going up to my uncle's uh room after school and he had a collection of albums up there that, you know canadian a lot of a lot of songwriters Joni mitchell gordon life with leonard cohen you know and then there'd be dylan and prine and, and you know just singer songwriters and i'd i'd 
I'd get into his collection and try to learn as many as I could. And that's kind of where I cut my teeth, you know, musically speaking. But then as I got a little older, I started hanging up with people who did play some trad music, traditional music and stuff. And so I fell into that world for a little while. And I was in a couple of trad bands that, that actually played across the country and played Vancouver at the Expo 86 and yeah. played there for a couple of weeks. And so, and that was a real good band. But then I, but I was always really drawn to writing my own stuff. So I, you know, I, I after that, I, I just focused more on, on, on writing songs and, and uh, doing my own thing. You're an exceptional and very prolific songwriter, Lenny. I really, I, I love your lyrics. Um, I never know what, what to expect, but I'm always uh, pleasantly surprised by, wow, another great album. Does it get, does it get easier? Does it get harder? Does, is it about the same when you, when you approach writing new music? I think the hardest thing is to find the friggin' time. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know, like when you're in this, when you're working in this business, time just seems to get eaten up doing various things and, and to just take the time to, to focus on the music and, uh, and, and make that your priority seems to be a bit of a challenge sometimes. And I find I write faster because of that. So when I do, get to, I, when I do get some time, I want to get the damn thing done quickly, you know. Right. Uh, Has the pandemic been been good for finding more time, or not really? Uh, interestingly enough, I thought I would write a, a lot of stuff during the pandemic. But I, and I talked to some other writers about this too. But it's 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 an odd thing for some of us. It's it it's been hard to come up with songs, but. Uh, just now, in the last few weeks, uh, it's the the dam seems to have broken somewhat, and, and uh, so I, I've written about a half a dozen over over the last few weeks, and a couple of them still need a little bit of uh, polishing. But uh, yeah, but it's starting to starting to come around now. Oh, that's good news. Um, I do want to talk about uh, Peter's dream. Sure. I know uh, it's maybe one of your most celebrated songs. It's an incredible tune, and it's you know it's well deserved, uh, critically acclaimed, and all the awards and success. Um, do you ever feel like you know your fans will want you to sing it at pr pretty much every one of your shows? Are you still happy? To, are you still happy with that song? Has it changed for you, given that you wrote it a lot, quite a while ago? The arrangement has changed a little bit over the years, but I, I never get tired of playing it. You know, uh, as long as people are into it, and usually it's a, a song that people will join in on. And uh, no, I, I I feel happy to play it if people want to hear it. What was the inspiration for it? That's an interesting thing because I wrote the song right at right at the height of the, the fishery, and I did grow up in a in a fishing farming community. And uh, the night before I wrote it, uh, it was right it was right at the when people when it became very obvious that the, what had happened to the oceans, especially on the East Coast, were in a real mess. And uh, uh, all kinds of uh, restrictions were happening for so many small communities. They were told they couldn't fish anymore, which meant the demise of the community. So it was pretty devastating for a lot of, uh, a lot of communities on the East Coast. And, and I was um, having a conversation that night. We had a little ga gathering uh, with a couple of friends of mine. And we were all talking about what that meant for... Uh, so many small communities, not unlike the one I grew up in. We talked late into the night. The next morning, I got up at six o'clock in the morning. And I could hear a few uh, fishing boats head out to sea from the community I grew up in because I was staying right on the harbor where I, where I was at that time. And uh, I sat down, I picked up the guitar, and it was just one of those gift songs, I think. It just spilled onto the page. I didn't change a word. I wrote the whole thing, I think, in about an hour. Wow. And uh, and I sat back after and because there's some interesting imagery in it. Uh, and I said, well, where did that come from anyway? And you start examining songs after and thinking, where did, where did the idea for that image come up? You know, because as you know, the, the song has some spiritual imagery and it talks about being on the Sea of Galilee. And, and I, I, for me, it was it's, it's not in any way as a religious song, but it's a spiritual song about the, the spiritual connection with the ocean that so many fishermen and women have. And uh, when I thought about it, it certainly wasn't conscious uh, in my mind when I, when I was writing it. But when I thought about it, I think it had something to do with being in Newfoundland. And I became very interested in an artist there named by Gerald Squires, who you probably know. Yeah. Very uh, powerful uh, work 
that he puts out. And I remember I had seen, this was years before I wrote Peter's Dream, and I had seen a collection of, of uh, paintings he had done with imagery just of what I of what I talked about, like, you know, the, the spiritual connection of, of fishermen and women with the ocean and what it meant. And he had done a series of paintings along that, and they were hanging in a church. And I, and I remember going off trying to find this church that they were all hanging in. And uh, after making a couple of wrong moves, I finally found the church. It was in Mount Pearl. And I went and I found, uh, I found the, the pastor and asked him if I could get in to see these paintings, which he let me he let me go in and they, were, and they were very, very moving. And years later, when I was writing that song, Peter's Dream, I think that, you know, I think it, it may have, though I wasn't thinking of it consciously, I think that may have played a role in, in why some of those images came and found their way into the song. I remember discovering Peter's Dream when it came out and just, it, it meant a lot to me too. I grew up in Newfoundland, uh, the Cod Mortorium, uh, you know, crush Newfoundland, and I think you get that mm. that heartbreaking tragedy through through these characters. Well, that's high praise. I still get up before the day breaks I still walk down to the shore I watch the sunrise from the eastern ocean But I don't sail to me anymore How could they ever let this happen? We saw it coming years ago The greedy ships kept getting sang an old sea shanty and nearly told a mainland joke and Kelly cursed and swore until his voice gave out and then he asked me for a smoke and then he took his father's shotgun walked to the harbor through the town he fired 14 times Woke everybody up We all watched that boat go down Last night I dreamed that I was safe See you, Galilee. 
Weak as down it's upon the water. Jesus, pull hold of the men with me. Pull hold of the men with me. Thanks for listening, everybody. Good night.